GCR. Faith comes by hearing. Listen to GCR. Genesis Christian Radio TV. I'm sorry the time of worship has been cut a little shorter this morning. But the, fir the first session is often the most difficult to discharge whatever the Lord happens to have given you. Because it's often shorter than all the other sessions. And after last night, I, I felt that there was a topic which I was wondering whether to address. I think I must address. But there are a couple of other topics which I need to address briefly, I think although I may have to ditch one of them, because I've been specially asked several times if I would touch on two particular topics. And uh, I, I, will, I, will break, I will break straight in with the whole issue of discernment. A number of people have said, will you please teach something on discernment? And it's, it's a subject which has been close to my heart ever since the, the days of the charismatic renewal when we were doing everything except discerning what spirit was at work. And it's a principal reason why the charismatic renewal movement went wrong. As Clifford said last night, if, if false doctrine leads to false prophecy. And likewise, false prophecy can lead on to a whole shoal of false doctrines so that we find ourselves in extra-biblical realms, some people said. The Holy Spirit was taking us on beyond the realms of Scripture. Well, if you hear somebody telling you that, run like mad, because the Lord just doesn't do that. When You remember when the disciples um, were looking at the temple with Jesus... And they were looking at these mag this magnificent building which Herod had constructed. They said, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And we think of earthquakes, famines, um, all, all sorts of things. But he started straight off, and it's recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. He said, see to it that no man deceives you. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will deceive many. I think it probably comes out best in Mark 13, but it's in uh, Matthew 24 and Luke 21 as well. So the first thing he went for was deception. And it's the devil's best work. The father of lies is extremely good at deception, as you would expect. And if he deceives us, he doesn't actually need to do any more. He doesn't even need to bother about persecution. If he's got a church deceived or a person deceived, that's fine. He can leave them just as they are, absolutely deceived. If they're, if they're believing lies, he's got them where he wants them. And during the period of the renewal movement, we had a lot of focus, uh, inevitably, and there was much excitement on the... Uh, Activities of the Holy Spirit, which we find particularly in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 was all very exciting, and uh, it started to be said that there were nine gifts of the Spirit. And I, I even heard one young woman on one occasion saying, My pastor's got all nine gifts of the Spirit. She didn't actually say he pops them in his back pocket on Sunday morning and brings them to church with him, but it was like that. You know, he comes along all equipped with all nine gifts, um, ready, ready to produce them at will. That gives a totally false impression of what Paul is trying to say. Um, a lot of people have thought that 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is all about the gifts of the Spirit. Paul doesn't even start by mentioning gifts. He starts off by with, with using the word pneumatica. Now concerning spiritual things. Pneumatica is not gifts, it is spiritual matters, or, some, or you can translate it from the Greek just, just concerning spirituals, brethren. He's going to talk about things of the spirit. And he says, I do not, I do not want you to be 
Um, deceived, confused, I can't remember what she said now. Ignorant, that's right. Um, he did not want them to be ignorant. And he mentions charismata, which is gifts, very few times. And for the sake of time this morning, I'm not going to read all the scriptures out because you'll be pretty familiar, I guess, with 1 Corinthians 12 and, and again with 1 Corinthians 14 where he deals more exclusively with the uh, administration of prophecy in the local church. He's talking to the local assembly. He's talking to group, groups of people, particularly the ones in Corinth who were in chaos. He was talking about the godly order in the local gathering. And when, when, he, when he said concerning pneumatica, brethren, he was going to talk about more than just the things that we call the gifts of the Spirit. And actually we mislead ourselves if we call them the gifts of the Spirit because that gives the impression that the Holy Spirit has given to us gifts to bring to the body. He hasn't. The word used for the activity of the Holy Spirit is phanerosis and is concerning the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and it takes you onto a whole new higher plane. Because you, you suddenly realise when you examine the words and that this is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit that these ninefold activities and one or two of them are referred to as gifts. We have gifts of healings for example. We do have gifts amongst them, but we have manifestations of the Holy Spirit in terms of tongues and interpretations and prophecy and so on. And one of them is the discerning of spirits. And uh, when you realize this is manifestation of the Holy Spirit, it suddenly dawns on you, or it suddenly dawned on me with a, with a sense... Um, well, almost, almost a shock that I had not realized this before. This is nothing to do with any one of us having been given the gift of prophecy or the gift of discerning spirits. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God himself manifesting himself in the midst of his people, which takes us onto a, a, a higher plane altogether. It's not, it's not just us being used by the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit himself in person there choosing to speak or act as he will through individual members of the body. So once again, the emphasis is completely off man and it's onto God. It's God who's doing it, if it's genuine. And we, we need to know if it, if it is genuine. Now, the, uh, when, it, when it comes to the matter of uh, discernment, the word actually used, the Greek word is diakrino, and it means the distinguishing between. It is distinguishing one spirit from another, specifically distinguishing, is this the spirit of God or is it some other spirit? And if it's some other spirit, then the whole church should be put on notice and I, I've never been in a meeting where this has been done. I've been in a meeting where afterwards somebody said, well, I didn't feel quite right about that. Uh, I said, for goodness sake, why didn't you say something? Because we, we are supposed to. Deception is the father of lies' best weapon. And, uh, and, and this, this, is, this is actually permitted all the stuff that we've had, like Kansas City and Toronto and Pensacola and, and now what's going on in Redding, California, um, all of this has happened uh, and been, been made possible because the body of Messiah has not been distinguishing what spirit is, is, uh, is at work. And the spirit of Antichrist, as I tried to put across um, on an early evening, um, uh, is powerfully active. The spirit of Antichrist is the principal spirit behind all these other powerful spirits which John enumerated the other night, behind anti-Semitism, behind... It's the spirit of Antichrist driving, preparing the way for the Antichrist himself to be manifested and to have a clear run. Now, discernment involves distinguishing between what is of God and what is not. If somebody in a meeting comes out with a tongue, 
Everybody should be tuned in, listening. Lord, is this you? Is this your spirit? Because it might not be. Normally, we say this, this is wonderful, and if there isn't an interpretation, which scripturally there, there absolutely should be, we pass on to the next song. We've done it for years. Um, doesn't happen quite so much now, because I think the Holy Spirit has withdrawn in disgust. I think he's been grieved and quenched so much, and he's not willing to make way for, uh, for other spirits to manifest and um, deceive the body. But we're told in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 19 to 22, it says, despise not prophesying, it says, but test all things, hold fast to that which is good, have nothing to do with any kind of evil. And all of this is in the context of what's going on in the public assembly. It's for the protection of the body. And we are to test all things. And uh, I can remember very few times when anybody has been has stopped a meeting in a gathering of the saints has stopped and said, "Wait a minute, we've got to stop there. We need to test this. We need to pray. We need to ask the Lord: Is this right? Is this true?" It just hasn't happened because leaders have looked rather perplexed. They've stood on the platform and saying, "What should we do to each other?" And they say, "The song. We we'll sing the next song, and, 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 and on we go." And the whole thing, and yet it's been said, and it's been heard, and it's been received into people's spirits. And they've probably believed it. So how are we to test? Well, the first, the first question is, does whatever the activity, or uh, does it line up with the truth of the Word of God? If it doesn't line up with the truth of the Word of God, then forget it. You can throw it out straight away. That's easy. Um, you, you, you know, probably know, for example, how um, banknote clerks are, are trained to discern genuine banknotes from false ones. They aren't given hosts and hosts of different false banknotes to examine and say, now, an Argentinian false one looks like this and a Greek false one looks like that. They're given the genuine article and told to become so familiar with it that as soon as they get a dud one in their hands, they will be immediately to say, something funny about this, not sure what it is, find out. This, this doesn't, seem, doesn't look right, doesn't feel right. They're taught by being so familiar with the genuine. And th this is another reason why the, the church, I think, has been able to fall into such error. We have been so unfamiliar with the word of God. The Word of God just hasn't been taught in most places. Uh, I mean, so, sometimes, well, I could, no, I, can't, I haven't got time to tell you certain stories, but I, I can tell you some horror stories of groups of young people that I've taught. I say young, I mean probably 20s, early 30s. And, uh, and, and I have discovered that they know virtually nothing of the Old Testament writings, nothing of the Hebrew prophets, and... Uh, you try taking them into the epistles. They wanted me to talk about the comparison of the Tower of Babel with the present-day EU. And I wanted to start off in Matthew 7. Uh, well, Matthew 2, actually, in Matthew 7. They'd never been taught the book of Daniel. And we tried other things. Um, nothing, in, nothing in the Old Testament uh, was, meant anything to them because they hadn't been taught it. So I said, well, let's go, let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2, if you're, if you're New Testament believers. Um, we'll, we'll start off with the man of lawlessness. And we'll, no, 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 we haven't done any of the epistles. And I found that they'd been, it'd been the Gospels and the Psalms, and that was it. I said, I suppose it's no good looking at Revelation and the, uh, the beast out of the sea. <laughs> not, not a bit of it. No, we've been warned off Revelation. And we had to start in Matthew 24 and then work forwards and then work backwards. And it took three sessions instead of one. And if you don't know the word, you're, you're at a great disadvantage in distinguishing the true from the false. Now, second, second line of defense you'll find in 1 John 2, and I do want to read this to you, because it is the witness of your own spirit within you. And if you're a believer and you've been, been baptized in the Holy Spirit... 
is what happened to me in that train when I didn't know what was happening. And the Lord doesn't always need to tell you what's happening, does he? He just does it. He says, I think I'll, I think I'll do this. And he leaves. Um, I'm sorry, 1, one, John, what's that? one, what's that? one John 2. Yeah. In 1 John 2, starting in verse 18. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop there, because uh, what, what is this all about? When you come to the Lord and you receive Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit quickens your own spirit within you to life, out of death. And you receive an anointing from the Holy Spirit which enables you to know the truth. It enables you to know God. It enables you to know what is of God and likewise enables you to recognize what is not of God. And I don't know how many of you have had this experience. I expect it's probably quite a lot. You find yourself in a meeting and, and, you, and your favorite preacher is on the platform or perhaps a much trusted, much trusted pastor is on the platform or teacher or whoever and you, you suspend your discernment because you trust the man but he can still get it wrong any of us can get it wrong I should be horrified when I find out how often I've got it wrong I, I hope the Lord hasn't kept a list but I suspect I shall have to find out a few things <laughs> But if you're sitting listening to your favorite guru on the platform and he's teaching and you're just not uh, really questioning at all what he's saying, you can be taken in. And probably most of you will know the experience. Suppose, suppose somebody was producing, um, perhaps a, a tongue came forth or an interpretation of, the, of that tongue came forth or, or a prophecy came out. And perhaps it was from the man on the platform. And you can get one base of three basic responses. One is that there is a rising in your spirit. You you feel it in your why why the Lord why the Lord put the spirit in the belly of a man? I don't know. I can only assume it's because it's maximum room for expansion there. <laughs> the, do you feel this rising in your spirit? You know, this, this, is the, this, is, this is the voice of my master. This is the voice of the Lord. Your spirit rises to it. Another, or you can get uh, a feeling of almost woodenness. Hmm, I don't know. It sounds, yeah, sounds all right. doesn't seem to ring any bells in me. I just feel a bit dead about it. In that case, the most likely thing is it's the man's flesh operating and churning something out, which is not necessarily desperately wrong, but it's not from God. So the body shouldn't receive it as being from God. Or well, sometimes you, you get sort of goosebumps or chills up and down your spine or whatever sort of manifestation you get, and you think, oh, there's something wrong here. But because it's my favorite man on the platform, I must be wrong and not him. That is, that, is the, that is the first line of testing after the, if, if it passes the test of the word of God. At that point, that's the time to ask the Holy Spirit who distinguishes between spirits, Lord, please show us what is going on here. Because, Lord, I feel there's something wrong. Please show us what manner of spirit there is. And in certain situations which I can think of, um, in fact, there have been many of them, uh, it may sound like a, like a strong word from the Lord, 
Um, and uh, perhaps it's to do with finances. And the Lord said, actually, it's a spirit of greed. It's a spirit of covetousness. Or it may even be a spirit of lust, or it may simply be a spirit of deception. Or it may even be the spirit of the Antichrist. You need to know, and the Holy Spirit is faithful to show you if you will simply ask him and say, Lord, I feel absolutely wrong to me about this. Lord, you know what this is. Please show us. At that point in the assembly, the, the, the Lord's intention was that we should deal with it, that we should put a stop to it and say we do not receive this as being from God. The Holy Spirit is indicating to us that it's false and the body is protected. Most of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians was for the protection of a body that was going completely off the rails because they were usually in the flesh and not in the spirit. Now, I, I, could, I could say a lot more um, about that, but I, I hope that's a, a basic, just a basic outline of, of basic testing. We need to distinguish between the spirits and the same in our own lives. Lord, is it you telling me to do this? Lord, please make it clear. Now, I want to go on. To, I want to go on to say one little thing, stemming out of the teaching about Gideon, because one of the um, characteristics of uh, a good soldier is courage. We've seen that it is absolute obedience, and it is the discipline, and in particular the discipline which is able to wait for the, for the commander's voice. If one of Gideon's soldiers had acted ahead of the moment uh, appointed, he'd have given the whole game away and 300 would have been slaughtered by thousands of Midianites. But I, I would like to just briefly uh, make, a, make a comparison, if I may. I'd like to talk to you about King Saul I'd like to take you to um, 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now oh, you remember, and somebody said this earlier in the week, God didn't want the Israelites to have a king apart from him. But... He said to Samuel, they want a king, give them a king. But this king, they, they really won't like it. This king will take. He will take your sons. He will take your daughters. He will take your vineyards. He will take, he will take, he will take. And in that day you will cry out to me because of the king that you asked for, but I shall not listen to you. And it's interesting, he gave them Saul as an example before he gave them the man after his own heart who was going to be a type, uh, a type of Jesus. King David came second. Even he made some blunders, as we know. But uh, this, this king, they, they appointed this king, and you remember also, probably in the, from the Torah, that uh, the Lord laid down the fact that when they did have a king, he was to be a native-born Israelite like themselves. And I believe, actually, what, what sealed the fate of the Jewish people at the time of the crucifixion was probably when they cried out, we have no king but Caesar. They, dis they rejected the law out of hand. And I, I believe that was the key point. It wasn't so much the crucifixion of Messiah, they, they, they were deceived, the Romans crucified him, but they choose to have Caesar as king. And that was so offensive to God and such a direct contravention of the law. I believe that was what guaranteed that Caesar in AD 70 arrived to say, all right, you chose me as king, here I am. See what I'm like. Because I'm going to be king over you, I'm going to rule over you. I'm going to tear down your walls and your temple. I'm going to call your land Syria, Palestrina. And, uh, and you are going into exile. It was a terrible thing. That was an awful moment when they said that. And the other thing they said was, his blood be upon us and upon our children. 
and the, the terrible effect of a self-pronounced curse of blood guiltiness. It, it has come right down generations. I've actually ministered to people um, with, within the last 20 or 30 years who have actually been under that specific curse and not known it. And that's not just three or four generations or ten generations, it's an awful lot more, because it was a permanent curse. Like the curse that uh, was put on Elisha's servant Gehazi, where it says that the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. If God says forever, it's forever, until the mercy of God steps in and says, all right, Calvary is sufficient. I remember a Jewish, a Jewish lady, a Jewish believer, um, who had been under absolute heaviness all her life, and she was well on in years, and, and she came to me and she said, uh, would you pray for me? And I was, uh, this was the 70s, and I hardly knew which way was up. But I said, well, gladly, I'll certainly pray for you. What, what do you want? And she talked about this heaviness. And I said, Lord, what, 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 what should I pray? I didn't know what to pray. Because I asked her, I said, has anybody else prayed for you? And she produced something which was like a who's who of deliverance ministry. <laughs> I mean, every, everybody except Jesus personally had prayed for her. <laughs> what can I do? It's the point at which I wanted to be somewhere else. And uh, I said, Lord, what do I do? Nobody else has been able to do it. What, 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 what? And straight in my mind came the scripture from Matthew 27, his blood be upon us and upon our children. And I didn't even know enough to, to, to specify that as being a, a curse of blood guiltiness. I said, Lord, well, what do I do with this? And the Lord said, you just lay hands on her and ask me to deal with the effect of this scripture in her life. So I did just that. I laid hands on her, and I quoted the scripture to the Lord, and I said, Lord, please lift the effects of this scripture off this lady's life. And the results were quite astonishing. She straightened up, the darkness lifted off her. Um, all of a sudden, instead of being stooped and bowed under heaviness, she was standing and saying, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. I was sort of looking around to find out where my jaw was because it had fallen on the floor. <laughs> and I, w I went home and started doing some research and learning something about generational curses. And thank God that I did because it was going to stand me in good stead. Now, here's, here's, um, yeah, here's, here's, dear old, here's dear old Saul. Now, I've got to cut this fairly short. When, when, uh, when Samuel anointed Saul in 1 Samuel 10 as, as king, he said, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power and you'll be changed into a different person. Verse 6. Go, verse 8. He gave him a command. Immediately Saul was put to the test. One simple command. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal, and I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. The first scripture I was ever given um, was Isaiah twenty-eight sixteen. 16. It's out of the King James Version. It says, He that believeth shall not make haste. Because I was a young man and I wanted to make haste. And it would have been a mistake. So if you turn over into chapter 13, remembering this command to go to Gilgal and wait for Samuel to turn up, you find there's trouble at Gilgal because the Philistines are assembling to attack. And it says in verse 5 of 1 Samuel 13, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. When the men of critical, uh, Israel, verse 6, saw the situation as critical and their army was hard-pressed, they hid. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and the troops with him were quaking with fear. Uh, he waited seven days. It mean, the Hebrews, he waited into the seventh day. He was in the seventh day. He wasn't yet in the eighth day. He was in the seventh day. And he got to the seventh day, the time set by Samuel, and the postman hadn't arrived. 
It says, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So what did Saul do? He pressed the panic button. The flesh press, presses the panic button. The spirit says, God has given me a command. I will obey and see what he will do. But Saul pressed the panic button, and so he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings, and Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. Isn't that always the way? When you've just done it, you suddenly find, the, suddenly find you're aware of the presence of God, saying, what's going on around here? What, what have you just done? You say, oh, um, uh, well, um, yes, quite. And uh, Samuel had no pity on him at all. And Saul saw him, what have you done, asked Samuel. Saul replied, I saw the men were scattering. You did not come at the set time. The Philistines were assembling at Michmash. I thought, the thoughts of men are useless, especially in a crisis. If he'd prayed, the Lord might have said, wait. But he didn't. He had thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. He had no business to offer any sort of offering. Saul was a Benjaminite. It was only the Levites. Samuel was a Levite. Samuel was the only one there who had the right to offer a burnt offering. And Saul actually disobeyed twice over. He didn't wait and he offered the burnt offering when it was completely out of order under the law that he should have done so. And Samuel just had no, no, no sympathy for him. You, ha you acted foolishly, Samuel said. You've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command all as a result of being unable to wait. And that was the only command he was given. He said, go to Gilgal and wait until I arrive. We have to wait, otherwise we shall blow it. And God usually makes us wait far longer than we think is, is right. He waits until we feel that the situation is so critical that we must act. And God says, no, I told you to wait. Well, Lord, we've got to act. The Lord says, you act. You, you, you'll wish you hadn't. Uh, we've probably all done it. I know I've done it. You act and then you say, oh, if I had waited, it would have turned out much better. Now, I can't, I can't uh, say all that I would like to about that, contrast it, but I would just like to uh, draw your attention to two comparisons. One is in 2 Samuel 5, where King David is up against the uh, Philistines in the usual way, and God gave him two separate strategies for fighting a, an identical battle. The Philistines came against him exactly the same way twice over, and the second time David did not assume that he was going to win the battle the way he had the first time. Second time the Lord said, strategy, circle around behind them, and when you hear the wind in the mulberry trees, then <laughs> fall upon them. And the prime example of waiting, what well, I believe comes in John chapter 11, it says, so when Jesus heard how sick Lazarus was, he stayed right where he was for three days. I think that must be one of the most difficult tests of his whole ministry. Because he said, they said, Lord, he who you love is sick. And he just stayed where he was. And then he said, well, Let's, let's go to him. And he did it so that God would be glorified. It was a messianic miracle, of course, but he did it so that the Father would be glorified because he did only what he saw the Father doing. Uh, I, want to, I want to turn to the, the, thir the third topic which the uh, Lord laid on my heart, which I wasn't necessarily going to try and tackle this morning, but I felt after last night I should. Because to carry us through the times ahead, we need to have the motivation that God gives. 
nothing, nothing else will do. And uh, we've seen it already in Exodus 32. We've seen that Moses was concerned for the glory, the reputation of God. And he pleaded with God. Just imagine if he'd said, yippee, that's fine, Lord, just do what you said. I think the Lord would have been bound to do what he said because God always does what he says. He must have known his man extremely well to know Moses will react in this way. Otherwise, he wouldn't have risked giving him the option. I mean, I think he gave him the option, knowing that, in fact, it was not going to be an option. Moses was bound to re sorry, react in the way that, that he did. Because Moses could have said, this is wonderful. Well, if he had, the, there would be a new nation entirely descended from Levi. So it would be a Levitical nation. Where are the prophecies of, uh, of, of Jacob in, in Genesis 49? And where is the lion of the tribe of Judah, which no longer exists? Uh, how does Messiah come out of Judah if Judah has been done away with? If there's only Levi, you had to have a Levitical priest. But he's not a Levitical priest. He's the, he's, the, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's of a totally different order of priesthood. But if Judah had gone, God's, God's plan was completely torpedoed. God took an enormous risk when he offered Moses that choice, but Moses was concerned for the reputation of God, and even not of himself. It would have been so easy to say, oh Lord, wonderful, just get rid of this awful lot of people. They always want to stone me anyway. Well, they did. He had to go to God more than once and say, Lord, they want to put me to death. But he said, Lord, your great name, your great name. This was his motivation, your great name. Now, Having, having seen that, you find in verse, in chapter 33, that Moses actually asks to see God's glory. Verse 30, chapter 33 and verse 18. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. That was what he wanted. He wanted to see the glory of God. He'd been up the mountain. I don't know how much he'd seen then, but he wanted to see more. He, he, he wanted to see God in all his majesty. He, he wanted Revelation chapter 1. He wanted, I dare say if he got it, he might not have wanted it because he'd have fallen down dead like John. And the Lord would have had to raise him up again. But he wanted to see as much of God as he possibly could. So the Lord said, I'll, I'll do all I can for you. Because he says, the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back but my face must not be seen. So the Lord showed him his glory to the extent that he could. And even if you don't see the Shekinah glory of the face of God, you see the glory of God in his character. And he was declaring his character to Moses. It's my goodness. It's my great name. It's everything that my name stands for. It's everything that's in God's name is, the, is God's character. Um, Psalm 138, Thou hast exalted above all things thy name and thy word. And he, speaks, he says, I have mercy, I will have compassion. But you can't see my face. But Moses, I can, te I can tell you what I'm like. And I'm sure Moses did get a real revelation of God when he passed by at that time. Now, let, let's, let's move on. I'm sorry to be moving so quickly, but I must. Incidentally, I believe that as the remnant, we have a particular prophetic task. It is to rebuild the walls of truth. Ezekiel 13. 
It says in verse 3, the sovereign Lord says, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Well, Clifford has been telling you all about the Kansas City prophets. They've been following their own spirit, or in fact probably a spirit of divination and a few other things as well. But then he says, Your prophets, O Israel, are like jackals among ruins. Well, the jackals just run about over the ruins, don't they? You have not gone up to the breaks in the wall to repair it for the house of Israel so that it will stand firm in the battle on the day of the Lord. Their visions are false, their divinations are lie. They say the Lord declares when the Lord has not sent them, yet they expect their words to be fulfilled. And he's asking us, he's asking for a body of people who will be the opposite. He's asking a body of people who will go up to the breaks in the wall. There are breaks in the wall everywhere where truth has been torn down wholesale within the body. He's asking us to, to be a prophetic people in the sense of standing in the, in the gap of these broken down walls and declaring the truth where the lies have been substituted for them. And we need to know our scriptures well enough to be able to say, that's not the truth of God. God says this. And we will be rebuilding the walls for the church and probably for Israel as well, ultimately, so that, the, so that we can stand firm in, in the day when God is really acting, in the day of God's anger. We can stand firm when God brings judgment. He wants the walls of truth rebuilt. Now, the motivation of God's glory was the motivation which carried Jesus right through his ministry. It's, it's uh, Ephesians 3 and verse 23 says, To him be glory in the church. We are to glorify the Lord in the church. But the Lord first himself, his, his desire is to glorify the Father. And I want to read to you from John 12. Come on. John 12. John chapter 12 and verse 20. And it's just before the Passover, and this is going to be the, the Passover where he is taken and crucified. And do you remember, Jesus quite often said, my hour has not yet come. He had to say that to Mary, didn't he, at Cana. Woman, what hast thou to do with me? My hour has not yet come. He meant, and he, he knew the hour that he meant. He said, it's, 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 not, it's not my time. But he knew there would come an hour. And here we find in verse 20, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, they would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Now, you never hear a word about these Greeks again in the whole of Scripture. They just disappear from the record. They're irrelevant. And yet, they came to Jesus. So what was the significance? I, I, I became, have become convinced that Jesus knew that there would be a sign from the Father which would indicate when the hour was at hand. Son, when two Gentiles come to you, when two Greeks come to you, asking to speak to you, that will be the sign. Then, then you will know the hour is at hand. And these Greeks arrived, and then they have no further relevance as far as the scripture is concerned. You hear nothing more about them. We don't even hear that he answered them, spoke to them. Nothing. His answer seems to be totally irrelevant, but it speaks volumes. Because what did he say? Who are these Greeks? Where are they? Not a bit of it. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He knew. And uh, he was fully human as well as fully man, uh, fully, fully divine. So if he's anything like us in his humanity, his tummy probably turned over several times and his head spun a bit and he said, Oh, Father, Father, this is it. This is it. 
This is what we've been moving towards, all, these, all this stuff. In fact, this is what we've been moving for since before the foundation of the world. This, and then he says, I tell you the truth, unless an ear of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it. While the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And he was speaking at that time, of course, to himself, as well as all to, to all of us. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and the Greek word is very strong. My, my, my heart is really agonized, would be a good word. My, my heart, my, he said, I, I, I really am tr in trouble. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Well, that was one temptation to, one, one possible opt-out, wasn't it? Father, take me out, send the angels now. Send more than 12 legions of angels and take me out. Could have said that. Maybe the Father would have done it and we'd have been lost. But he said, no, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This was his motivation in all that he did. This was the motivation that always carried him through every crisis, every situation, was the glory of his Father. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard, heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Remember how he said, Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came out. He knew it all. He knew exactly what it meant. And he didn't know if he could cope with it. Because it meant something that none of us have to experience, and he had never experienced. He knew it meant experience, experiencing <coughs> eternal death, experiencing separation from the Father. Not just physical death. don't think that was the, re the real worry. He knew that he was going to have to go through the agony of being cut off from the Father at the time when the Father turned his face away. And he just didn't know if he could bear it. And probably the father didn't know if he could bear it either. But they were going to do it. And they were going to do it for us. One wonders why. Just because of the love of God. Because God is a God who makes covenant and keeps covenant. And um, the just just to, just to finish off as quickly as possible, just in two minutes, or perhaps three minutes, Sorry, I've gone as fast as I can this morning. Um, there are two particular scriptures, again in John's Gospel, which speak to me very loudly of how God wants us to be within the body. God wants two things. And they go together and you can't separate them because where you've got one, you get the other. Now, let's just have a quick look. Verse 15, where he's talking about being the true vine. His father is the gardener. If a man remains in me, verse 5, and I in him he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then, verse 8, This is to my father's glory, that you bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. He wants his body to bear fruit to the Father's glory. What, what is this fruit that he's talking about? My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends. That is the agape love. That is the fruit that he's asking for. It's the fruit, uh, the, the Lord gave us an example when I was an elder in the Marlowe Fellowship, spoke to us very clearly 
in one uh, prayer meeting and said, you do not yet understand what it is to literally lay down your lives for one another. He said, but I'm going to give you a start point. I want you to be willing to inconvenience yourselves for each other, to really put yourself out, to put the other's interests first. He said, that, that's where you start. So we received that, we believed that was God, and the next day I had to drive down to Worthing for a prayer meeting. And it was a long prayer meeting. I got home about 11 o'clock at night, absolutely dead beat, thinking of nothing, nothing more than probably falling into bed. And, 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 uh, and when I got in, Valerie told me that there's been a message for you. And a brother in the fellowship, one of those for whom I was responsible, had rung up uh, and said, please, could I get in touch as soon as I got back? And I thought, oh, can't I leave it till the morning? Oh, no, no, I can't leave it till the morning. No, no, it won't do. So I, I rang up this brother. He was a good brother. He probably still is. I don't know where he is now. I rang up and I, I said, Lawrence, you want to speak to me? He said, yes, we've got... It was a godly household too. He said, we've got all hell breaking loose here. He said, they had three or four children, one of the boys. He said, one of the boys, he said, he's... He's, he's absolutely demonised. It's been chaos all evening. The whole household has been in turmoil. I don't know what's happened to him. Something's got into him. And he said, can you come down? <laughs> well, they lived five miles away. And I said, oh. I said, Lawrence, let me put the phone down and pray and I'll be back in five minutes. I hadn't got the phone onto the hook before I heard a voice say, inconvenience yourself. <laughs> And I didn't get the phone back on the hook. I picked it back up again and said, I'm coming. <laughs> and I drove five miles to his home. I felt absolutely dreadful. I thought, Lord, I can't do a darn thing. Lord, I've had it. Uh, today's over as far as I'm concerned. I got to the house and it was, it was chaos. The boy thought it was. I don't know what he'd been doing. I think the Ouija boards came into it. But, um, and this boy was normally fine. But he was all over the place, and the household was in turmoil. And um, it wasn't an easy deliverance either. I left the house, I think, about half past two or three in the morning. The boy was free. The household was at peace. And to my amazement, I drove back home. I felt as fresh as a daisy. <laughs> I was ready for anything. I thought, well, I'll go off. But that was a simple test. I thought I'm hoist with my own petard because I had had the word which said inconvenience yourselves in the previous evening in the prayer meeting. And then the Lord put it to me the very, the very next day. Now John 17 goes absolutely hand in hand with this agape love. I don't know why these pages are sticking together. but And Jesus, of course, this is the great high priestly prayer before he, go, before he goes to the Father. Interesting, isn't it? I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. If he prays for us who belong to him, he doesn't need to pray for the world. Because we're here to do the job. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Yes, please, Lord. Thank you. <laughs> Lord, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Anyway, then he goes on to pray for all who will believe through the testimony of those disciples. So I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. One. All of them may be one, Father. It almost ties it up in knots, the, the, the uh, wording. One, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. It's like a knot being tied so tightly. that, you, So that the world may believe that you have sent me. The unity of the body of Messiah is the primary evidence to the world that Jesus is who he says he is. so that the world may believe you have sent me. When, they look, when the world looks upon a body of people who uh, love each other and are knit together in unity in that way, the world will know this has got to be God. In fact, they did in the early days. And they will again, please God. 
He said, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. It is the motivation for the glory of God which binds us together. It is the agape love which lays down its life wherever necessary. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. These two, you, John 15 and John 17 are inseparable. Where you've got the one, you get the other. If you haven't got the one, you can't possibly get the other. You can't get the unity without the agape love. And you can't find the agape love if there isn't unity. These, these are the ways in, in which principally, as the, as the corporate body of Messiah, we bring glory to the Lord. To him be glory in the church. I'd love to go on for hours and I must stop. God bless you and thank you for listening. GCR. Faith comes by hearing. Listen to GCR. GCR TV. Teaching the Word of God on YouTube and Facebook. More details at genesischristianradio.com
Genesis Christian Radio.